The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived, or even better. The rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing. Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as Ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. 
Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with Parasaurolophuses. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kind of cute. People ride horses, camels, Parasaurolophuses and Pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame Velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost as same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses, would have survived. But in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA, and it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Can you swim? Good. Because you're going on a journey to the deepest point of the Pacific Ocean. Now put on your flippers. The very bottom of the Mariana Trench is awaiting. Now get in the water. Really? Come on. All right. One foot underwater. That's the depth you can swim with no special gear like a mask. Hey, look! Must be some tourists. Or whales. Ten feet underwater. 
that's a little deeper than the public pools and beaches around the United States. You can see colorful fish and even photoplankton that feed on the sun's rays. 26 feet down. This is the depth at which the foundations of the floating city of Venice in Italy stand. Builders laid columns at that depth on which they later built houses and streets. 30 feet underwater. You start to feel a lot of pressure. When you're on the surface, you're under atmospheric pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. But here, at 30 feet, that pressure is doubled. All the air pockets in your body, like your lungs or ears, begin to compress from this pressure, giving you discomfort. But no worries, your organs are soft and elastic, so you can keep diving. 40 feet underwater. Oops, you're running out of air. An average person can hold their breath for 30 to 90 seconds. The current record is an incredible 24 minutes and 37 seconds. Gasp. Okay, you'll need some diving equipment to continue your descent. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tourists dive to this depth to look at reefs and corals. You don't need special skills for that, but you can't dive any deeper without training or a license. 45 feet down. Be careful. There's sharks swimming here looking for food, like you. <laughs> Sometimes tourists descend to this depth in a safe cage to see the sharks up close. You're better off staying away from these predators and not attracting their attention. So make sure you're not wearing any bright and shiny jewelry. Sharks love that kind of thing. 62 feet underwater. You could see the Aquarius Reef Base Lab in Florida at this depth, if you were in Florida. It's really an entire building with rooms for exploring the seafloor, accessible through a hatch. 105 feet down, you see a strange bell hanging from a chain. People used to use these things for deep diving about 400 years ago. They'd lower a bell on chains with divers inside from a ship. There was enough air inside the bell for them to breathe. That way, they could explore sunken ships with treasures. 140 feet. At this depth, you could find an entire sunken city in Qianda Lake, China. You can still see streets, houses, and temples there. 330 feet. Whoa! You almost hit a huge blue whale! How could you miss it? These guys, the size of two train cars, usually dive to that depth. Shh! Let's listen to them sing for a while. It's beautiful! Now, let's keep going. 660 feet. This is where most of the ocean life ends. Sun rays hardly penetrate any deeper into the water. Everything below are unusual fish like this angler. They have such an unusual appearance because they have to adapt to the high pressure here. 702 feet underwater. This is the last mark where you'd see a human without diving equipment. This man holds the title of the deepest man on Earth, and he's the only one who has managed to get to this depth. The water pressure on his body here was 20 times greater than that on the surface. 985 feet. Ooh, what was that sound? Whoa, that's a submarine. That's the maximum depth they can dive to. Some of them can reach speeds of 26 miles per hour. Fun fact, an ostrich can run twice as fast, but she can't swim. 1,090 feet. Say bye to this scuba diver. You won't see them any deeper than this. The world record was set in the Red Sea. It only took the diver 12 minutes to reach this depth. But it took him a whole 15 hours to return to the surface to avoid decompression sickness. So now you get an atmospheric deep diving suit. It's completely sealed, and you won't feel the insane water pressure on your body in it. 1,454 feet. If you stuck the Empire State Building in the water, its tip would be here. And all the carpet inside of it would be wet. 2,300 feet down. The water pressure here is 70 times greater than on the surface. The flexible plastic parts of your suit can't withstand that kind of pressure. So here's some urgent delivery. It's an ultra-deep submersible. Now you can continue your dive all the way down. 2,717 feet. Here you'd see the tip of the tallest building on Earth, the Burj Khalifa. All right, who's sinking all the tall buildings around here? 5,387 feet. This is the depth of one of the oldest and deepest lakes in the world, Lake Baikal. Its area is slightly larger than the entire country of Belgium. 8,040 feet. That's the record depth the Perdido oil platform reaches in the Gulf of Mexico. 
and its above-water part with three decks is almost as high as the Eiffel Tower. 11,962 feet. This is the average depth of the Atlantic Ocean. You can see a huge tube as wide as a giraffe's neck. And it just seems to be endless. True, this cable connected Europe and North America and used to serve for telegraph communications. 12,303 feet underwater. Suddenly, in the darkness, you see the outline of a ship. No way! That's the Titanic itself! The intense water pressure would crush a person at this depth. So you can only dive down to the Titanic in a submarine. 13,123 feet. Whoa! Here would be the end of the deepest mine in the world, Impon and Gold Mine in Africa. But you still have deeper places to go. Let's speed up! 20,000 feet. Here you can see the deepest debris of an old ship. The USS Johnson sank more than 70 years ago. You can still clearly see the number 557 on its bow. 26,200 feet. Here, in this total darkness, you'll find the deepest fish in the world, the Mariana snail fish. They're as long as a domestic kitten and have almost transparent skin. Their eyes are poorly developed for vision because the sunlight never reaches this deep. 29,030 feet. If you take Mount Everest, flip it over, and stick it into the Marianas Trench, this is exactly where you'd see its tip. Even though this is the highest point on our planet, you'd still have a lot deeper to go. 35,755 feet down. Here, in the Challenger Deep, you'd still see life. You'd need a microscope for that, though. Bacteria living here feed on organic molecules, similar to oil. A little deeper? Congrats! You've touched the bottom. It's 36,070 feet deep. The pressure here is 1,071 times higher than on the surface. But you're not the first person to have been here. One of the last expeditions to the bottom of the Mariana Trench was in 2012. An American filmmaker descended here in a submarine he designed himself. But the pressure broke some of the engines, so it was hard for him to maneuver here. The sonar was also damaged, and some of the batteries drained. He was in the Challenger Deep for about 3 hours and took many pictures and videos. If you look closely at the bottom itself, you can see bubbles. It's carbon dioxide and liquid sulfur. It's freezing here because of the extreme pressure and temperature close to freezing. But there's still life here in these harsh conditions. The three microorganisms are most common here – xenophyophores, amphipods, and small sea cucumbers. There's so few of them because they don't have enough food down here. Usually, there's a lot of palm leaves on the ocean floor, which get there from the land. But the Mariana Trench is 124 miles from the nearest islands. So the only food here is old plankton and fish scales from the ocean's upper layers. But it needs to travel tens of thousands of feet to become food for the bottom dwellers. But can you go even lower into the crust of the Earth? Well then, you'll need to unleash your giant drill and fire up the jet engines. You're pushing another 36 miles through the Earth's crust. And here is its edge. You've entered the upper mantle. It's an ocean of hot lava, 1,800 miles deep. You have to literally swim through this, reaching the outer core another 1,400 miles deep. Then you reach the inner core. Another 755 miles and congrats! You're at the very center of the Earth. Um, I hate to ask, but how do we get out of here? Icy water squeezes your chest so you can't take a deep breath. You hear people yelling around. It's late at night, and the endless sea blends with the black starry sky. You're scared and cold. The ship you were just aboard is going down into the depths of the ocean. People who have been in a shipwreck often remain afraid of water for the rest of their lives. But the woman whose story you'll hear survived not one, and not even two, but three ship disasters, and continued to work on cruise liners as a stewardess. Meet Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable. Her childhood can be described in one word, short. She had to grow up quickly to take care of her siblings. Violet was the oldest of nine children. Life became even more difficult when she became very ill. The doctors were sure she wouldn't survive, but she did. At a young age, she moved to England with her mother, took care of her sisters, and attended a convent school. 
Her mother worked as a stewardess at sea, and when she fell sick, young Violet followed in her footsteps. But because of her youth and beauty, no one wanted to hire her. They thought she would distract passengers and crew. Violet didn't give up, though, and came to one of the interviews in her worst clothes and with unkempt hair. She wanted to show she was ready for hard work on the ship, and she had it. The girl was hired. The first two years passed quietly. But then, a series of incredible fortunes began, or misfortunes, depending on how you looked at it. In 1910, Violet got a job on the most luxurious liner of the time, the Royal Mail Ship Olympic. The ship sailed across the Atlantic from England to America. The engineers didn't focus on the speed of the vessel, but on its comfort. Violet worked on the ship and was paid just two pounds a month, the same as 200 pounds today. Hard work on the ship's deck from morning to night didn't frighten Violet. She loved the job. She liked to talk to people and enjoyed the beautiful views of the Atlantic. So, on September 20th, 1911, Violet worked on the deck as usual. The sea was calm and the weather was excellent. Nothing boded ill. The ship sailed through the Solent Strait, which separates the Isle of Wight from the British mainland. At this moment, the British military cruiser Hawk appeared ahead. It should have passed by the Olympic, but something went wrong. The ships went straight at each other. The Olympic's captain tried to maneuver to avoid a collision, but failed. The Hawk's bow was designed specifically to ram other ships. At that time, it rammed the Olympic. Boom. The liner shuddered, and the people screamed in fear and panic. The ship had a huge hole in the starboard. Violet fell from the force of the blow. It seemed one of the biggest liners of its time was going to sink. But luckily, that wasn't the case. Both ships stayed afloat, and nobody got hurt. This time, fortune was on Violet's side. The accident on the ship didn't frighten the young woman. She didn't give it a second thought and continued to work as a stewardess. In April 1912, she took a job on the best unsinkable ship of the time, where she was supposed to serve VIPs. Initially, she didn't want to work on this ship, but her friends persuaded her. And thus, she boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912, and left the port of Southampton for better or worse. The first days of work were peaceful, but on the fourth day of the voyage, one of the most notorious disasters in the world struck. Violet was resting in her cabin. She was almost asleep when she felt the jolt. At that moment, she was called to the upper deck. When the Titanic hit the iceberg, almost no one panicked. No one believed that the unsinkable ship could actually sink. At the time when the ship's hold was being filled with water, everybody was calm on the upper decks. Violet, along with other stewards, was present during the evacuation to the lifeboats. Women and children were evacuated first. Then, one of the ship's officers ordered Violet to get into a boat to show the other women it was perfectly safe. When she did, others followed, and someone suddenly thrust a swaddled baby into her hands. Without a second thought, Violet hugged the child to her chest to keep it warm, while the Titanic was sinking. She didn't let go of the baby until her lifeboat was picked up by the Carpathia, a ship that came to the rescue. Already on board the ship, a woman ran up to her. She didn't say a word and snatched the child from Violet's hands. Violet thought the woman was the baby's mother, so she didn't try to get it back. She was too freezing and numb to think how strange it was that this woman hadn't said thank you to her baby's savior. Many years later, Violet would be reminded of this child under unusual circumstances. After successfully surviving one of the most terrible shipwrecks in history, Violet continued to work at sea against all odds. In 1916, she took a job as a nurse on the hospital ship Britannic, a sister to both the Olympic and the Titanic, which sailed in the Aegean Sea. On November 21st, the ship took a route that it had already sailed several times. But on that particular day, 
it was out of luck. The Britannic hit an underwater mine. Violet managed to survive the third shipwreck in her life. This rescue wasn't as easy as the previous two, though. After the explosion, the huge Britannic began to sink quickly. It took less than an hour for the ship to go down completely. Violet didn't have time to board a lifeboat, so she jumped overboard into the cold water. There, she swam to the closest lifeboat and got on. But the rescue turned into a new danger. The ship's propellers were still working. They were spinning in the water and pulling the boat toward them. Violet jumped off the boat just in time to escape the propellers. But her ordeal was far from over. Already in the water, she was pulled under the ship's keel and hit her head. The only thing that saved her from losing consciousness and probably her life was her thick hair. In the end, Violet got away from the engine and was picked up by another boat. For the next few years, Violet was plagued by headaches. When she finally went to the doctor, he told her she was incredibly lucky. As a result of the incident on the Britannic, she had a fracture in her skull. Three disasters that Violet managed to survive didn't stop her. She continued to work on cruise liners until 1950. She cruised the world twice on the luxury liner Belgianland. Fortunately, the string of mishaps ended, and Violet was never shipwrecked again. In 1950, she moved to Great Ashfield in Suffolk County. She'd worked at sea for almost 42 years. Content with her career, she settled in a large cottage built in the 16th century. But a year into her retirement, she received a strange phone call. It was late at night. Violet was asleep when the phone rang. She picked up the phone. There was a woman's voice on the other end. The lady didn't introduce herself and asked right away, Excuse me, was it you who saved a baby on the Titanic? Violet answered, yes. It was me, the strange woman said. She laughed and hung up. Violet told her friend about this strange call. He assumed that some kids were playing a joke on her. But Violet had never told anyone about the baby before that call. According to the old records, the only child who was on the boat with Violet was a boy. But those same records also said the boy had been saved by another passenger. It's still unknown who the baby that Violet rescued was. And so, for surviving three different wrecks on three different ships, she was aptly dubbed Miss Unsinkable.